I'll be reading from Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should behold and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. To praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself, that in the dispension of the fullness of time, he he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who has worked all things according to the counsel of his will. That he who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of his promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bina. What a marvelous reading. Praise God. Can I just at this time thank the technical team and those who work behind the scenes so that we can do something here at All Nations Barclay Avenue. We appreciate you coming out and and helping. Uh, And just that song, brilliant. Wasn't that lovely? Uh, So Small Nations starts again next week. So children, I hope you're enjoying that. I hope you are indeed enjoying that. Praise God. Well, today we start a new series based on the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, I would say, is probably one of my favorite books along with the book of Romans. It's, a, it's an amazing book. And right now from, uh, from today right through to Easter, most of our Sunday um, focus will be on the book of Ephesians. We encourage you to get out to the home groups. Uh, George mentioned about the new Thursday group. Uh, it, yes, it is a study group, but it's only for those of you who are not in a home group. If you're in a home group, you will be looking at the material through your own uh, networks. So if you're not in a home group, we'd encourage you to get involved, and particularly on a Thursday night. So this is an amazing book. We're going to be spending a lot of time on Ephesians, and we're going to be well blessed. And I pray that the Word of God, because the Word of God has power. And just as the reading went out this morning, and just as we talk about the Word, I pray that the power of the Word of God will change your life. Amen. I know we can't sing, but we can say amen. So if, if, if your mouth there is a little bit, uh, and you need to open that mouth, just say amen. I don't mind. Praise God. In the first three chapters of this book, Paul explains something of our wealth in Christ, something of the riches of our inheritance that we've been forgiven, we've been redeemed, we've been accepted. It's an amazing, amazing uh, introduction. And in those first three set, first three set chapters, he sets a foundation talking about our wealth and who we are, how rich we are in Christ. Then from chapter 4, he changes to a practical section of his letter, and he says, walk worthy. And the word walk is interesting because it's mentioned several times throughout the book. It's not run, it's walk. What does he mean? He means our behavior, our, our lifestyle. And he says, walk worthy of your calling. And we have been called. 
called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because of what God has done in our lives, Paul says, I want your lives to be transformed. I want your lives to be different to the person who doesn't know Jesus. I want you to, to live differently, think differently, behave differently. So walk worthy, walk in love, walk circumspectly. And later on in the course of this year, we'll be looking at, at the practical section of this letter. But Paul starts by showing us our identity in Christ, that we are the children of God, that God our Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And he shows us as God's children what God has done and what God will do. In verses 3 to 14, which we will look at this morning, and as I say, we're not looking at it in depth on a Sunday, just skimming over some of these verses. But in these verses, Paul praises God that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And then next week, we will look at verses 15 to 24, where he prays. He prays that we would have perception and an understanding of who we are in Christ. He prays that we might know the hope of our calling. He prays that we would know, know something of the greatness of his power. That we would have opened eyes to grasp the fullness of his blessing. Someone once said, we enter this book through a magnificent gateway. God the Father is the source of every blessing we enjoy. Listen to how he says, bless it be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen, who has blessed us. Not will, not may, not, but has blessed us. It's past tense. Every blessing that you're living now is past tense because God has done it, amen. Done it because it stems from the cross in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has blessed us with every, not some, but every spiritual blessing in, were in heavenly places. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, as his divine power has given us all things. I want you to understand that all things, everything that you need for life and for godliness, God has given to you. You don't have to lack. God has given you all that you need to live the abundant Christian life here on planet earth. And the theme of this book is heaven has touched earth. And heaven has touched earth in our lives. And we need to understand that, that we are kings and priests unto our God. Yes, there's coming a day when the physical kingdom will come here on earth, where there will be peace and righteousness forevermore. There will be no more death, no more pain, no more COVID-19, amen. Because we will live in a perfect environment. But we see from this letter that heaven has touched earth in a spiritual sense. The kingdom has come in our lives today, presently. Paul talks, or the writer to the Hebrews talks, that we have tasted of the powers of the ages to come. Yes, it's just a taste. I know some of us, we were fasting this week, and we, we, we enjoyed our first bite on Saturday morning. Uh, and I certainly enjoyed my first bite. But the, the meal I, I prepared, it was just a taste, a little taste. And what you're receiving today in your experience of God is just a taste. The full meal is coming when we see Jesus face to face. The full meal is coming in the ages to come. That's our hope as believers. But we don't go without today because in this present world of suffering, in this present world of conflict, we still have tasted something of the age to come. Note what he says in, in verse, three, verse 3. He says, we are blessed, blessed with all spiritual blessing. 
And then in verse 4, he goes on to say, just as he has chosen us in him for adoption. Amen. God is our Father. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have been chosen and adopted into the family of God. The church in which I belong to and the church in which God called George to in Christ 40 years ago, George. <laughs> Happy birthday, by the way. 40 years. He was just a youngster. But boy, we celebrate. We celebrate a journey of life because God has adopted us into his family. But the church we belong to is not an afterthought. Because before the foundation of this world, God had George in mind, not 40 years ago, but before the foundation of the world. Amen. God had a purpose for our lives. And to be members of his family here on earth. What amazing thought. We have been adopted into the family of God. Paul says, having predestined us to the adoption of as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In verse 6 he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted. <coughs> Praise God. Accepted. We're no longer rejected. <coughs> we are accepted. Accepted in Christ. <coughs> God has lavished. I love that. <laughs> God has bestowed. He's lavished his grace on us. In verse 7 he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God has bought us. We belong exclusively to God. We don't have time just to go through uh, all the ramifications, what it means to be redeemed, what it means to be adopted, but we just know that God's love is upon us. He's lavished. He's lavished his grace upon us. And then in verse 9 and verse 10, we see something of revelation. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. We're no longer in ignorance. We're no longer in darkness. We have an understanding. We have an understanding of the mystery of his will, praise God. Thank you, George. A little frog in my throat, we, but this will help. Praise God. <clears throat> Thanks, George. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. So in other words, in the ages to come. What's going to happen? That in the ages to come, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Basically, Paul is referring to all peoples, all races, all nations, particularly Jews and Gentiles. We will be one, amen, gathered together in all things in Christ. But God has given us, shown us the mystery of his will. He has, he has made known to us his will and the purpose to which he set his will for us in Christ Jesus. God has, has done more than chosen us in Christ in, in past eternity, he has given us sonship right now. He has made known to us the mystery of his will in the future. You see, history really is his story. And all things center on his plan and his purpose. And the world may live in fear for the future. In fact, many people today live in fear and anxiety, a lot of fear because of what's going on with COVID-19. Uh, Can I just say, just kindly and with gentleness and with grace, God has called us not to live in fear. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. He's called you to be wise, but not fearful. Because my life, every day, is in, in, in God's hands. I'm in, I need to trust God. Amen. I don't run around waking up in the morning afraid. 
I wake up in the morning with peace in my heart that God is in control. And we need to understand history is his story, that his purpose and his plan is in his hand. And as believers, our future is moving toward a climax and God is in the center of it. Praise God. In verse 11, he goes on to say that we have an inheritance in him also. We have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Remember, you are what you are by the grace of God. But it was God who took the first step. Because the Bible reminds us that we were without strength. But whilst we were without strength morally, spiritually we were dead, Whilst we were without strength, in due time, God sent his son to die for us. So God lavished his grace on us, and now he's working out his eternal purpose in our lives. And these blessings that we have in Christ relate to the past before the foundation of the world. Amen. And they relate to the present and the future. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to uh, look at the word according. You'll find it referred to several times. In verse 5, we read, being predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ. According. According to what? According to the good pleasure of his will. And over and over again, we get this phrase, according to the good pleasure of his will. You thought that day that when you came to a road of faith 40 years ago, that was all you're, you're doing, George. Yes, uh, in a sense, you, you came and you made action and you took a step of faith. But you were dead and it was God by his spirit who awakened you. Amen. Because you, you live, and I, you and I live according to the pleasure of his will. It's his will. He's in control of my life from eternity past to eternity future. And again in verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according, according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Amen. Nothing to do with me. It's to do with his grace and his love and his mercy. And then again in verse 9, we read, having made known to us the mystery of his will according, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And again, if you look at the word according, look at the phrase good pleasure of his will. We find that again in verse 5. Amen. According to the good pleasure of his will. In verse 7, we have it again. Having, uh, in which we have his grace abound toward us in all prudence. Amen. According to the riches of his grace. So God is in control from eternity past to eternity future. Amen. Our God sits on the throne. So on a practic practical way, as we're looking at the Word of God this morning, I want the Word to give you power. I want the Word to go out this morning with power. And if you're living in fear and wondering what life is going to be, I pray in the name of Jesus that peace will come to you right now. I pray if you're living uh, in fear for tomorrow, I pray that peace will come to you right now. I pray that the word will bring peace and joy into your life and you will understand that God is in control of his plans and his purpose for our lives. So let me fast forward time. Hmm. We often think what life will be like in five years from now, 10 years from now. And as you get older, you know, someone said life is like toilet roll. <laughs> the closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> and if you think that life is getting fast, it's because we're getting close to the end. <laughs> but I'm so glad I believe in eternity future. Amen. Praise God. 
So let's wind the clock forward, not 10 years, not 20 years, but 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 1,000 years from now. What will life be like? Well, Paul tells us something here in Ephesians just about life in the future. Amen. It will, God's kingdom will come in perfect peace and harmony. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. You might want to underline that. There's, a, there's a, another age coming. Praise God. You see, when I die, life doesn't just stop. I do not believe in annihilation. I do not l- believe in that when life comes When death comes, that there is nothing thereafter. It just stops. No, friends. Our hope is not just today. Our hope is in tomorrow. Amen. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And then in chapter 2 and verse 6, he goes on to say, he says, And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come. Over and over we see that little phrase, in the ages to come. He's going to show us off. We're going to be trophies of his grace. We're going to be looked at and said, there's my church. The redeemed, the ones I adopted into my family in the ages to come. Oh, what a day that will be. So let your imagination just run away. What is it going to be like a thousand years from now? See, death is not the end. We will bury our loved ones and put them in the grave. And we leave them there. But God will not leave them there. Because there's coming a day of resurrection, praise God, that in the ages to come. So we have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And listen to what Paul says to uh, the Ephesians in in chapter 5. He says, for you were once darkness. That's what I was. That was my identity. I was lost. I was dead. I was deluded. I was dominated and controlled by the God of this world. Totally lost. I was in darkness, but my identity is no longer darkness, but now you are. Amen. This is where I'm at present. But now you are what? You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Praise God. See, the kingdom will have a future manifestation. But it has already arrived in the hearts of those who believe. Heaven has touched earth. (laughs) Heaven has touched earth. Did you pick up the little phrase, in heavenly places? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, not some, but every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In verse 3. In verse 20, we read the same of Christ, where we read he sits uh, at the right hand of God, Uh, sorry, verse 19, God raised him up from the dead and seated him at his right hand were in heavenly places. And then again in chapter 2 and verse 6, we read the phrase again, and raised us up. (laughs) You see, Jesus was raised up, we're raised up. Raised us up together and made us Sit together in where? Heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 3 and verse 10, we read, uh, talking about the church, 
to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church. In other words, the the whole diversity and and the spectrum of beauty and the spectrum that the fact that we're all from different cultures and different races, amen, hallelujah, different tribes, different nations, all shapes and form. Uh, But this is the, the manifold wisdom of God to the intent that the, the, the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church, who too, to the principalities and powers, were in heavenly places. Heavenly places does not refer to heaven itself, but the realm in which you and I live. We see in chapter 1, it's where Christ sits. In verse 19, we read that, and what a, sorry, let me read from verse 19 of chapter 1. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God, were in heavenly places. So heavenly places is where Christ sits. It's where you and I as believers sit. Because when we look at this later on in chapter 2, we see that because of his mercy and grace toward us, we who were dead, God has raised us up, amen, and he has made us sit together, who with, with Christ were in heavenly places. Now, you can say amen there. I know you're dying to shout. That's where we sit, friends. So heavenly places does not refer to heaven. It refers to the realm in which I live. I live in heavenly places. Joy, peace, life. Amen. No longer fear, but joy. No longer death, but life. So we can just say, glory be to God. So right now, In our present world, in the midst of all the pain and suffering and all that's going on with COVID-19, we can still enjoy the privilege of being blessed with Christ. In life and in death, no matter what comes my way, nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Then in verses 11 to 14, Paul looks at the scope of these blessings. Not only have we received an inheritance, we are an inheritance. We belong to God. God delights in in us. Look to what he says in verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you have believed. In whom you also trusted. You see, faith is the key in receiving the blessing. How do we bridge the gap between what God says I am and what I live right now? With all the pain and brokenness and weakness of my life and in this flesh, how do we bridge the gap? Faith is the key in bridging the gap. Faith is the key in me walking in my identity. Rather than living in fear, with no understanding of who I am, being robbed of peace and joy, being robbed of life itself, faith is the key. And I pray as believers that faith will arise in our hearts, amen. That we will live the life that God has ordained you and I to live. So this is my perspective in the mornings. This is my perspective in the midday. This is my perspective when I put my head on the pillow at night. God is in control of my life. Amen. 
I no longer look at the struggles of life. I don't deny them, but they're not my focus. I will focus on the blessing. I am blessed with all spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And as long as you live here on earth, there will always be a gap between your position in Christ and our experience of that position. Don't ever let someone say, well, you can reach perfection and you'll reach a day here on earth that you won't sin. I had some like that at All Nations at one time. In fact, you, could, you couldn't be honest with them. You couldn't say that you're having a bad time. Well, you shouldn't be having a bad time because you should be li- living in perfection. I, th- I got rather annoyed. R- r- I met someone in the toilet of all places. I said, oh, I had a bad week this week. Oh, pastor, you shouldn't have a bad week. I thought, oh, I won't talk to you again, but I had a bad week. <laughs> there are those who just, they live, they live on a, it's not real. There will always be a gap from my position in Christ to my experience of that position. However, God does want me to walk by faith, amen. But I will never be perfect. I will never be perfect. I will only be perfect one day on this planet when Jesus comes. And I will see him as he is and I shall be like him. But listen to what Paul says. Having heard the word of truth. Hearing the word is the first step in moving into Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And maybe you're listening to me this morning here at All Nations or online. And this is all new to you. And the fact that you're hearing the word and you're hearing the gospel right now, God by his spirit can make you come alive and bring you to a place of understanding. Because the word brings faith. They heard the word of truth. Hearing the word is the first step from getting out of darkness into light. And the second step, having believed. You need to act on what you hear. You see, faith is not passive. We experience God's forgiveness and God's redemption and the adoption of God, we experience all that on the basis of our repentance and faith. Faith is action. It's not just an intellectual belief. It's not a passive thing. It is something I do. I come to a place and say, Lord, I give you my life. Today I repent. I turn to you. I I, I give you my life. And I pray today that you will allow the Spirit of God to, to bring you from A to B, from darkness into light, that you will come to an experience of understanding God's so great salvation that you too will be on this journey of faith and destiny. Many think that they are born again But they only have an intellectual faith based on their knowledge of God. What you need is not an intellectual faith. What you need is a saving faith where you put your trust in. Having trusted, having believed. And I pray that you will put your trust in. And Paul goes on to say, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Being sealed with the Holy Spirit speaks of ownership and security. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us everything that He has promised. The moment George and I became Christians 40 years ago, 45 years ago, (laughs) praise God. In fact, it will be 46 years ago next month, George. I'm older than you, my brother, by six years. But that day, there was a witness in our heart by the Spirit. We felt a witness in our heart by the Spirit. And the Bible talks about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the first installment to guarantee us that which God has started in our lives, He's coming back to bring to completion. 
He's going to finish his work. You might think, well, look, am I saved? Am I not? Will I, will I carry on? Listen, as you walk in faith and continue in the faith, God will complete the work which he has started. Listen to what Paul says. Being confident. Oh, glory. Who said that the gospel is, a, is so uncertain? One bishop said that one time. But we don't believe that, bishop. We believe the word of God. Amen. Being confident of this very thing. What very thing? That that which God has, that good work that God started in our lives, he will what? Listen, he will what? He will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. There's our hope, friends. Here's the book of, of Ephesians. You are blessed. You are redeemed. You are adopted. You are accepted. God has lavished his grace upon you. Everything we have, it comes in Christ. It comes from God and it returns to God. It begins in his will and it ends in his glory. And I pray that you will discover something of God's will for your life. And I pray today, I pray today that you will just allow God, for those of you who are believers, that you will understand your identity. You will understand who you are and allow God, that you live your life at the center of his will. For those of you who are not believers, I'm going to pray right now. Just, just close our eyes, bow our heads. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you, you believe the Christian faith, but you've never come to a place of trust. You've never come to a place of believing. You've had an intellectual faith, but you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit sealing you. You've never experienced something of the fact that you know that you're forgiven, that you have received eternal life. And just as we are praying here today and you're praying online, I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring you to a place of faith. I want you to pray something like this. It's your prayer. So why don't you just close your eyes and bow your heads. You're watching on screen. Just do it right now. And ask God to come into your life. Ask God to control your life. Ask God just to take, give you direction. And pray something like this, your prayer. Dear Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. And I know that I am lost. I have no guarantee that I will go to heaven. I hope I will, but I don't know. I don't have the assurance. I don't know if I'm forgiven. I don't know I'm lost. But today, I acknowledge you. I've heard your word, and on the basis of your word, I pray that faith will come into my heart as I put my trust in you as my God, as my Savior. So today, I receive your love, and I receive the gift of eternal life and the gift of forgiveness. I turn my life to you. Today, I receive the gift of eternal life. So please forgive me of all my sin as I trust you and receive eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you've prayed that prayer, why don't you write to me at office at All Nations. You've got the details there on our website. We'd love to give you some literature called Just Grace. Because God wants to establish you in his love and mercy and grace. And if you've prayed that prayer today here at All Nations, uh, just why don't you come and say something to him and I'll give you a little booklet. The Lord bless you. Amen.